Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2. You know, oftentimes we say something and by the time that it hits the ear of the person that we've said it to, it's nowhere near what we intended for it to come. Y'all ever do, does that ever happen to you? I heard about this uh, utility man as he rang the doorbell at this house and some lady came to the door and she, he said to her, said, ma'am, I'm, uh, I'm really a, a good handyman and I'm just looking for some work. And she said to him, said, are you a good painter? And he said, oh yeah, I'm a real good painter. And she said, well, I got a little work for you. And so she said, you wait right here. And she went back in and came back with a gallon of green paint and a paintbrush. She said to him, said, now out back, I want you to take this paint and I want you to go paint my porch green. And he said, well, I can do that. And so uh, she said, now when you finish up, you come back around to the front and uh, based on you know, the quality of work, we'll, we'll take care of you financially. So about two and a half hours later, here he comes back and the paint bucket is empty and uh, he is getting ready to get settled up on what she owed him. And, he said, by the way, ma'am, I think you ought to know that uh, in your backyard, it's not a Porsche, it's a Mercedes. So that happens sometimes, doesn't it? What we say doesn't always hit the ear of the person that we are saying it to. Uh, I wonder what you think about when you hear the phrase, the second return of Christ. What hits your heart? What, what, what emotion that you face? Do you dread? Are you passive about it? Is there a sense of passivity that hits you about that? Or when you hear the phrase, the second return of Christ, does it cause you to be excited? Does it cause you to have some joyful anticipation? It, do, do you at least wake up one day a week and the thought hits your head, Maybe Jesus could come back today. What goes through your mind when you hear that? Second Peter chapter three kind of tells us, just hold your spot there in Titus, but Second Peter three kind of relates a little bit maybe what goes on in our minds. And they were raising the question, well, since Jesus hasn't come back, is he coming back? And since he hasn't come back by now, in all probability, he's not coming back. So on 2,000 years from when Jesus made those promises that he was coming back, maybe we still have the same spirit and attitude that they had there in 2 Peter, but he hasn't been back in 2,000 years, so in all probability, he's not coming back. Titus chapter two, pick it up with me in verse number 11, if you will. T Titus chapter two, I don't know why in the world I'm in 1 Timothy, but I will get out of that. And uh, verse number 11, the Bible says, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The question is, where is the promise of his coming? We've been pointing to this day for a number of weeks. We've talked about the privilege of salvation. We've talked about the privilege of eternal security. We've talked about the privilege of the Holy Spirit, the privilege of prayer, and on and on. And today, we finish up this little series with a message entitled, The Privilege of the Blessed Hope. Somehow, we have put his second coming on hold because we believe that there are more important things than looking for and hastening the day of God. So what goes through your mind? when you hear about the second return of Christ. When Jesus came into this world for the first 300 years following that, well, the first couple of hundred years following his 
ascension back into heaven, uh, the church had a way of greeting that's a whole lot different than what you and I uh, have today. We'd walk up to somebody and we would say, hello, how are you? Well, the greeting in the early church was repetitive. It was the same phrase over and over and over again. And you find that phrase really in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and uh, verse number 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22, you find the early church as they were greeting one another, they would not say hello, but listen what they would say. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema and then maranatha. They would walk up to a person and they would say maranatha, maranatha. Maranatha, how are, not how are you or how are you doing, but Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord, come quickly. Why? Because that was the blessed hope that they lived their life by. That was the blessed hope that they held dear in their heart. If you know him, if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming back of the Lord Jesus to this earth is a blessed hope. But if you are not one of those that has trusted Christ and been saved by the grace of God, then when we talk about the second coming of Christ, it really strikes a note of terror in a person's heart. Now there are two comings of Christ the Bible talks about. One is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. The other is found in Revelation chapter nine and some of the following chapters in there. But the fact of the matter is they are mutually exclusive. They don't have a whole lot in common. Why is that? Because they are two different events with two very different purposes and with two very different uh, times. 1 Thessalonians 4, and I will close the message out probably in that chapter, it's the coming of the Lord Jesus in the air when he will come nearly back to the earth but not all the way back to the earth. And the Bible talks about that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, that is you and me, the Bible says shall be caught up now, those of you that have a fear of flying, you better get over it. Because uh, as Jesus followers, we have a first class ticket and it's gonna be a tremendous ride and we're gonna be snatched away. By the way, you won't even get to finish what you were doing. Whatever you were doing, you'll just leave it behind. And then seven years later, the Bible talks about the second coming of Jesus for an entirely different purpose. His second coming is going to be a coming of vengeance. And it is that second coming that I want to focus in on today. But I don't want you to forget, when I'm talking about the second coming of Christ, don't forget that seven years prior to that, the trumpet of God is going to sound and we're going to be caught up. So it's a lot closer than the second return. I want to make this statement and then we're going to build from it. There are some very good reasons that we should be longing for, yearning for, hungering and thirsting for the soon return of the Lord Jesus. With that in mind, let me give you a few of them. Number one, we ought to be yearning for the second return of Jesus because of Jesus. You understand, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back the second time, he will be getting what he deserves. He didn't get it the first time. There was no room for him in the end. His own did not receive him according to the word of God. He was rejected and he was snubbed. And um, you can mark it down that when he comes back the second time, he will get the respect that he should have gotten the first time. The first time the Bible says that he came as a lamb, but the next time that Jesus returns, he will come as a lion of the tribe of Judah and his roar will be heard all over the earth. The roar of wrath and of judgment 
and the scriptures bear this out. Turn in your Bible to Revelation, if you will, chapter number 19. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 15. The Bible says, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. When he comes back that second time, all rights, all wrongs are going to be righted. When he comes back the second time, all of the prophecies of the word of God will come together for a great climax and culmination when Christ returns. Psalm 2 says that Christ will rule and reign with no interference in the whole earth. In Psalm 24, excuse me, Isaiah 24, 21, he will manifest his power and show of might and light. In 2 Thessalonians 1, the Bible says he's coming to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled in all that believed and placed their trust in him. You understand when Jesus comes back, he will be acclaimed, he will be applauded, and he is going to be welcomed and afforded a place in this world that he should have been afforded the first time that he came. Now, we ought to be excited about the second return of Christ, not only for Jesus, but because of Satan. Now, we're gonna have some fun with this because the fact of the matter is, not only will Jesus get what he deserves when he comes back, Satan's gonna get what he deserves when Jesus comes back all of the defeat and the dishonor and the complete and total humiliation of him and his killing and his destroying. Now, here's the thing about it. The longer that I walk with God, the more that I am in faith with Christ, the more sick and tired I become of Satan's ploys. I am sick and tired of Satan destroying home after home after home, marriage after marriage. I am sick and tired of the way that he is decimating churches all across this land. I am sick and tired of the way that he has substituted what the church ought to be about with those things that the church should have no dealings with at all. Somebody asked me from time to time, preacher, don't you get mad when people don't get saved, when you give an invitation, don't you get mad at them because they won't walk down that aisle and receive Jesus? Absolutely not. I don't get mad at people when they reject Jesus. I'm gonna tell you what I do get mad at. I get mad at the devil because he has kept them blinded from the truth. I'm sick and tired of his ploys. Now, let me help you know something here this morning, church. Listen to me, those of you that are watching by live stream. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you ought never to be afraid of the devil. You ought never to be afraid of Satan. I, I, my, my friend that I have known for a number of years wrote a little book called Words Aptly Spoken. His name is Bob Moorhead. Uh, Bob doesn't hardly even know that he's in the world right now because of dementia. But one day he sat down and he penned these words. He says, Satan, take note and listen well. You will not conquer me. I am blood washed, daily delivered, strongly sanctified, spirit soaked and word and dwelt. You are wasting your energy on me. I have set my face. I am linked with sovereign and eternal power. You're a deceiver, but you won't deceive me. You're a roaring lion, but I'm not gonna be devoured. You're extremely subtle, but I'm on to your ways. You parade as an angel of light, but I walk in a stronger light. Your days of deception are over with me. I won't be detoured, derailed, distracted, distorted, discouraged, or disillusioned by your schemes. Your influence will no longer cross the no trespassing sign on the gate of my life. I'm off limits to you now. My doors are closed to you. You won't walk in, crawl in, sneak in, slither in, pry in, or barge into my life. I have a permanent guest who now lives inside and he will not share my temple with you. 
You may lure, lie, linger, lurch, laugh, but you won't come in. Your days are numbered. Your kingdom doomed. Your designs are dwindling. Your evil eroding. Your devilishness dissolving. Your designs decaying. Your progress is poisoned. And your ultimate victory party has been canceled. You can't trap me with your teasing, soil me with your subtlety, or defeat me with your deception because he that is in me is greater than you. So get off my property. Amen. 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 But I run across a lot of people that are like the old martyrs of the faith in Revelation 6 and 10 that cry out, how long will you refrain from avenging our blood. Or maybe you're like the folks in Isaiah that cried out, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. You, you, you must remember, you should remember what the ultimate end of Satan really is, what the ultimate fate of his existence. You understand that when Jesus returns, all of the activities of Satan will cease when Jesus sets up his earthly reign. In Romans chapter 16, the Bible says that he will be crushed. The Greek word there really is flattened. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the Bible says he's gonna be thrown into a lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever. Now, let me just give you an old phrase that's been used and worn out, but it's still good is that when Satan comes to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. I'll never forget a number of years ago that I had a Satan worshiper that was really stalking my life. It was the weirdest thing. I could walk into my house and somehow he had gotten my number and he would call my number and he would know when I was at home. And then when I would go to the office, uh, my phone would ring and I'd answer and he knew exactly where I was 24 hours a day, seven days a week and I witnessed to him and I talked to him and I encouraged him to turn to Jesus and I'll never forget the last conversation I ever had with him. I said, well, sir, I, I guess this will probably be the last thing that I'll ever tell you is that you need to be reminded that hell is not a place where Satan is going to rule and reign and be king. It's going to be a place of torment for him forever and ever and ever. And I never heard from that guy ever again. So you remind him of what his future is. Now let me give you the third thing that we ought to be excited about, the return of the Lord Jesus. Not only for Jesus, not only for Satan, but for creation for creation. Didn't God do a spectacular thing when he created the universe? But the problem came when Adam and Eve disobeyed the commands of God and they ate of that forbidden fruit and it plunged the earth into a convulsive mode that has been deteriorating for years. Look with me, if you will, at Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51 and uh, I, I want you to see with me verse number six. Isaiah chapter 51. I'll give you just a minute to uh, discover that. Isaiah chapter 51. And uh, look with me at verse number six. Now the Bible says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. And the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. And my righteousness shall not be abolished. Now those of you that have listened to me preach down through the years, you know that I don't have very much patience with environmentalism. But the fact of the matter is, we are still to be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. We're to be good stewards of the air. We're to be good stewards of the water. We're to be good stewards of the forest. We're to be good stewards of the animals. There is no doubt about that. We are to take care of God's creation. But because of the slippage into our thinking of evolution, 
animals and trees and insects have now been elevated to the same level as mankind. So that now, you think about it, a horse is a man, a goat, snake, a bear. And so what's tragic is, is that when you come across environmentalism, you also are discovering that you're neck deep in the midst of humanism that are holding on to evolution. You know, I find really that it takes a whole lot more faith to believe in Darwinian evolution than it does in Genesis chapter one and two. So to the all, all the oil, excuse me, to all of the owl preservers, to all of the tree huggers, to the salmon strokers, to the manatee massagers, I got a word for you. It's all gonna wear out and there's nothing you can do about it. It's all gonna wear down according to scripture. But what God's word has said is that we will be given a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible describes it in Isaiah chapter 11 that the wolf will lie down with the lamb and the lion will eat of the vine like an ox and a child will play over the opening of the serpent and not even be afraid to be bitten. In Romans chapter eight and verses 18 through 21, uh, matter of fact, let's just read that for a moment. In Romans chapter eight, I don't want you to take my word for it. Read with me, if you will, Romans chapter eight and uh, begin reading it in, in, in verse 18. I believe that's the passage and I may be wrong and if I am, I'm just gonna eat crow here, but <clears throat> Romans chapter eight, for I reckon that, yeah, this is it. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In other words, the natural resources of our day are going to be depleted. Yes, we are to take care of them. Yes, we are to be good stewards. But ladies and gentlemen, we are not to worship the creation. We are to worship the creator. I'm excited about the second return of Jesus. Also because of international peace. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting phrase today because we hear about it all of the time. Currently, there is major emphasis and a lot of time that is given between Israel and Jordan to sign a peace treaty. Uh, we're watching as our leaders are uh, trying desperately to get a peace treaty with Afghanistan. Did you know that Russia has never signed the peace treaty uh, with them and Japan that was expected to be signed right after World War II. And they're still not signed and they're still arguing uh, about its context. In Isaiah chapters and also in Micah uh, chapter number four, the Bible says that they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning huts and nation shall rise no more against a nation, and they will remember war no more. Now, why is that going to be like that? Because we have such a great United Nations? I think not. By the way, we're still spending $3 billion a year plus from the United States our budget's only about 1.3, but actually we're spending over $3 billion to try to seek international peace that the Bible says is never going to come until Jesus returns and sets up his earthly reign and will reign in peace for a thousand years. Now the Jews are well aware of that. Now let me give you the last one if I could. We ought to be excited about the return of Christ because 
the Jews will get what they have been promised. Salvation, respect, priority, and a special place. Now, let me help you with this for a moment. Um, Israel is still God's chosen people. Yeah, they rejected Jesus. Yeah, God turned to the Gentiles. But not at the expense of the Jew. The church is not the replacement for the Jewish nation. One day, that's all going to be made right. In Zechariah chapter 12, turn over there with me if you will, Zechariah, and I know you don't read Zechariah much in your daily devotions, but if you will get to Matthew and hook a left, uh, you'll come across it pretty quick. In Zechariah chapter number 12, I want you to see verse 10. What a powerful prophecy that this is. God says, I will pour upon the house of David. Now, that clarifies right now that he's not talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about the Jew. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Powerful prophecy. When is this going to happen? In the millennial period, after the return of Christ, when he sets up his reign upon this earth. Look with me, if you will, at chapter 13 and verse number one. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and of uncleanness. In, in other words, God says, I, I'm going to once again turn my attention back to the house of David so that they could be forgiven of their sin. You see, the idea is that God is going to give them another advantage and the idea that they will take advantage of that advantage. And then in chapter 14 in verse 3, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Uh, as when he fought in the day of battle. Now watch this. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east and on the Mount of Olives, shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. One of these days when Jesus returns, the Bible says that he's going to plant himself on the Mount of Olives and that Mount of Olives is going to split in two and half of it's gonna fall north and half of it's gonna fall south and there'll be this huge valley that is created. I've been on that mountain five times. I'm going back in May, love to have you with me. And as I walk across that mountain, I'm thinking to myself, I'm wondering, <laughs> I wonder if my foot is anywhere near where the, Jesus is gonna plant his foot. I wonder if I'm walking somewhere that Jesus one day will settle down on this old mountain. And I'm thinking to myself, man, wouldn't that be something if I were standing where one day Jesus is going to return. Isaiah chapter 60, 61, 62. If you really wanna know what's gonna to happen to the nation of Israel, I want you to go read those chapters. Isaiah 60, 61, 62 you're going to find that the Shekinah glory of God is gonna to return to the nation. You'll find that the temple is going to be rebuilt. You'll find that there will be nation after nation after nation that will rally around the nation of Israel and will become their allies. You will discover better than any of it is that that will be the place where Jesus will abide in peace for a thousand years. Wow, what a blessing it is going to be to the nation of Israel. Revelation 7 says there'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists that will be secured in salvation. There's going to be two that will walk across the face of the earth back and forth. God is going to do great things for the nation of Israel. Look again at Zechariah. Go back to chapter eight. Maybe you are still in that book. I hope that you are. And look at chapter eight. And verse number 23, thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
in those days, what days? He's talking about the millennial. It shall come to pass that 10 men shall hold out all of the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Now, dozens and dozens of verses, 30 of them out of the prophecies, if you will, concerning the nation of Israel. Take your Bible now and look with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number four. Real quickly, if you will, 1 Thessalonians chapter number four. I wanna read to you about the rapture of the church that is going to occur seven years prior to what we've been studying this morning. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number four. The Bible says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. Y'all, I've done hundreds of funerals. Hundreds of times I have been with family after family and I promise you, you can tell the difference between a family that has hope and a family that does not have hope. I've literally watched people as they would climb over into the casket of their loved one and beg for them to be able to come back and return and cry out, oh no, oh no, oh no. I've had people say, oh pastor, my family's in hell, pray my family. I've had those kind, but I've also had those that do have the hope. They may weep, and they may grieve, and it's healthy. And the reason they're grieving and weeping is because of that temporary separation that has occurred between them and their loved one. But all the while, they have that hope that has swelled up within them. I will see them again one of these days. Death is not the final thing here. This is just a temporary time. Notice what he says. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Oh, powerful word for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain shall not precede them. Oh, but I like this next part. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I don't know what that shout's gonna be. The Bible doesn't tell us what it's gonna be, but it, it, it may be something like, all right, it's time. Or come up here. He'll descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Corinthians tells us that when that trumpet blows, this mortal is gonna put on immortality. This corruption is gonna put on incorruption and we're gonna be changed in a moment, not in the bat of an eye, but in the twinkling of an eye. We're gonna be changed. The trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be whoop, caught up together with them in the clouds. Why? To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise God, no more lumbago up in heaven. No more arthritis up in heaven. No more migraines up in heaven. We'll have a brand new body fit for a brand new place. The clock of life is wound but once and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. To lose one's health is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more to lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. The present only is our own. So live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Sweet Heavenly Father, thank you for 
this word today that is reminding us of the promise of that blessed hope of your imminent return. That return is going to bring all kinds of great things that will happen. Until then, God let us hold on with great anticipation to that day. But all wrongs are going to be made right. When you're going to deal with our adversary, finally and forever. God will be given a brand new body, fit for eternity. I pray for those that are here this morning that maybe a message like this that would create some kind of anxiousness and anxiety and fear. God, may today be the day that they understand that the only way to deal with that is coming to faith in Jesus Christ and trusting him as their Lord and as their Savior. God, I pray that if there's some folks that are here that have never turned away from sin, never known what it's like to have the peace that passes all understanding, have never known what it's like to walk in victory, never known what it's like, Lord, to be an overcomer. I pray that today they might turn away from sin. Today they might say yes to you. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.